decided to end the show with Benji Wagner of Polar, Outdoor Stuff, and then go have a party in his shop. That's even the best, that's the best part, right? <laughs> this is the best part. <laughs> so I know Benji has been working super, super, super hard, and I think, you know, where you see Polar everywhere and everything they're doing, it's obvious. So uh, we are so thankful he's here. We really appreciate him taking the time to work on this presentation and be here. So welcome. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I got kind of a loose talk. I've never really done this before, so I thought I'd try and uh, uh, touch on a variety of things and make it a little bit more of a conversation, maybe have some questions and um, interact with you guys a little bit rather than just uh, drone on forever myself. Um, but I think uh, I'd just like to say thanks for having me. Um, and thanks to so many of you that are here that have supported Polar um, from the beginning. A lot of people um, have been really generous and really supportive in the industry. And I'm really kind of an outsider to the industry. Um, my background is not in design. Um, and I definitely don't feel like I'm a great designer. I'm certainly not a technical designer. Um, <clears throat> my background is largely in uh, photography and filmmaking. Um, I'm definitely a design enthusiast. but uh, I never really designed much until we started Polar. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, I'd really been focused on uh, working for other brands, um, doing a lot of kind of uh, storytelling, and web content, um, films, uh, photography, and as a freelancer for years. So that's kind of where I came from. Um, I grew up in action sports, and uh, primarily, but with a father that was extremely uh, involved in the outdoors. So. We kind of did a lot of camping and road trips and, and hiking, backpacking, as well as I was really involved in skateboarding and snowboarding and that kind of culture. So I just kind of, that's my general background. I didn't really want to talk uh, too specifically about um, just sort of the narrative of uh, where Polar came from, because um, I think you can learn that pretty quickly online or um, you know, just talking to, to me or others in conversation. So I kind of wanted to um, speak a little bit about kind of a broader cultural um, shift in our uh, entire culture and then how I perceive that relating to uh, the outdoor industry because that's really why I uh, started the company. We didn't start, um, you know, with a kind of genius backpack design or some uh, mission to reinvent um, the way people use products or how they interact with products or not really, that wasn't the idea. The, to me, I, I felt that there is a, a really large uh, generation gap, um, just period. I think the internet has created um, a generation gap that is much greater than ever in human history. And I think we're only really starting to see kind of how profound it is and how broad it is and the effects of it. And it bleeds into all industries, and certainly it's going to, I think, uh, you know, part of the reason this conference exists <laughs> is because on some base level everyone is recognizing that. But I just want to start by kind of peeling back uh, into uh, the past. So <clears throat> we're going to start in a, sort of the pre-industrial revolution and uh, talk a little bit about the kind of culture of where our culture was at and just quickly kind of talk about where we started and how technology changed things um, really rapidly and how I think um, that relates to our industry and into kind of all our careers and where, where the future is going because I, I put a lot, of, uh, a lot of thought into that. There's certainly a lot of people that can speak uh, out in the world much more intelligently and specifically about technology and futurism and things that are, uh, you know, super detailed in that world, but I kind of uh, put a lot of thought into, like, how that relates to the outdoor world. Um, <clears throat> so, I thought uh, it'd be good to start with some quotes from uh, people that I admire that are a lot smarter than me. Um, one of those people, to me, uh, was super influential to me was uh, the writer Kurt Vonnegut. I'm not sure if any of you 
uh, read Kurt Vonnegut. Um, I kind of discovered him as a teenager and read everything he wrote and he's kind of became really uh, influential to like how I perceive the world and, and just my thought process in general. <laughs> this quote was from quite a while ago. Uh, he's passed away, but I think this is probably at least 20 years old, which is interesting to me. Um, he said, <clears throat> what should young people do with their lives today? Many things, obviously, but the most daring thing is to create stable communities, communities in which the terrible disease of loneliness can be cured. And I think that's super intriguing to me because he said that kind of prior to smartphones, prior to the web, I think, um, prior to so much of what I think uh, we spend our time on uh, in today's uh, world. And yet, even then, he identified um, loneliness as a sort of such a specific and kind of daunting problem in our culture. And I think it's, it's still, uh, it still is, and I think that a lot of what people, um, it's sort of taboo to talk about, I think. It's an interesting thing to me. It's almost like sex in a way, where it's, it's kind of ever-present, and so many people feel lonely in our culture, and are uh, deep down extremely lonely, and searching for community and connection, but are, uh, you know, really terrified of admitting that or ever talking about it. I don't think I've ever seen anyone on Instagram talk about how they were lonely. For instance, which is just interesting to me, I mean, people kind of celebrate all these things, or they'll admit defeat, they'll admit failure, but, um, you know, loneliness has really been uh, augmented and, and really intensified by the internet, I think, in a lot of ways, and uh, there's some people that have, you know, really put uh, much more thought and written some amazing books and <coughs> about that that you can dive into, but in a really general way, I think what, uh, I'm trying to express is that as kind of the internet <coughs> took hold, it was originally so much about communication. I think we're all mostly old enough to remember when we started using the internet, and it was more about information. Whether you were doing an email or looking up a fact or researching something you were interested in or doing a report, that is sort of the root of, to me, my experience like as a teenager when I started to use the internet. And to this day, it's still a large part of what the internet is used for. Um, but I think that's where social media came along and often gets really lumped in with sort of digital and the internet. But to me, social media is very, uh, it's sort of intrinsically different than the web. And um, kind of want to talk about that a little bit as well. <clears throat> but going back to sort of the beginnings of our culture, I think, Really, we, we all lived in small communities, you know, and um, people were connected to the people around them just physically and were in front of, of other people and communicated with other people um, that they knew and that they worked with or were family or their enemies or whatever it was, they were right, you know, right up in their face essentially. And sort of the idea of uh, having your, your relationships were essentially dictated by geography in a large degree and by class and by sort of local issues and, and things that you grew up with, whatever they were. Where as time went on, then technology really kind of blew that apart and made it so that, you know, we can really, I mean, travel, everyone moves around. That is obviously not a new idea. Everyone knows that our lives are much more fluid. We can essentially go anywhere, anytime in a way that is really in the scope of human history, a very new thing. Um, and I think, you know, at that time, outdoors was really an intrinsic part of daily life. You know, most people somehow spent their days outside, just on a base level, if they were farmers, whatever their job was, it was, you know, there were no, <laughs> nobody was sitting in cubicles. It was a lot of physical work, a lot of connection with animals, a lot of connection with the weather, understanding, you know, where they were uh, from and what the history of that place was, even weather-wise. And I think that's just important to note. I think that was a really deep, important thing in humanity that slowly got chipped away at and then was kind of obliterated recently with the internet. <coughs> um, you know, I think it's sort of a, it's, this all ties into, as time went on in our culture, I think the idea of community was really, um, 
it really kind of fell apart in a slow motion. And the idea of the self became the most kind of, uh, to me, one of the most important and kind of interesting ideas of the last century is really the idea of the self and the idea of self-expression and self uh, adoration and, and sort of uh, self-indulgence. Anything that you can think of where people really focused on themselves, their creativity, what they wanted out of life, um, and less and less about how their life connected to other people around them, connected to even their family, or what they, um, kind of how they affected others. It became more and more, uh, in our culture, particularly American culture, I think, became a self, a lot of pop culture clearly uh, became more and more sort of a celebration of the self and creativity uh, and, and what people are able to do as, a, as an individual. Um, that sort of, uh, I think, feeds into kind of present day when, when the internet really took hold of all our lives. And I think it's really easy to, to kind of forget how new it is <laughs> because it dominates our lives so tremendously, particularly smartphones. I mean, you know, we're really only talking about a couple years um, to the, uh, that it wasn't very long ago that all of us in this room were not looking at our phones at all. And it's almost one of, to me, it's one of the most profound, like uh, kind of quickest modifications of human behavior in the history of mankind is how quickly we've all become addicted and incredibly linked to these phones. There's even the internet prior to that doesn't even hold a candle to just how reflexively we all are, you know, trained essentially to constantly be referencing our phones, looking at our phones, no matter what situation is, people are looking at phones. Right now, I check my phone, you know, in the street, and the, you, it's just endless. And uh, it seems to trump anything else, any other kind of social boundary or norm or anything, any situation. There's no situation that's, uh, you know, sort of taboo not to look at your phone. It's, it's just become so dominant. And I don't know, if, did anyone see uh, a video that, I, I don't know if you know the comedian Louis C.K., but he had an interview on Conan where he talked a lot about uh, cell phones and his kids. And it actually really hit me. I have young kids, and I thought it was, uh, it was funny. He's very funny, but it was also really profound. And one of the things that he talks about is how looking at your phone, you know, it used to be bad, you know, kind of going back in time again. If you, if you wanted to tell someone to go to hell, you had to, you know, get in their face and tell them to go to hell. <laughs> and basically, if you wanted to tell them you loved them, you told them. And, it, and watching their face and having that kind of human interaction was really important and meaningful. And, you know, insulting someone would actually have a consequence of some kind. Maybe they'd cry, maybe they'd attack you. But, you know, kids now and adults, if you can just kind of fire stuff off into the ether and you don't see how it, it affects anyone, it kind of really profoundly changes your interaction with other people and uh, how you perceive sort of what is okay, whether it's love or, or hate or insulting someone. And I think that's the, the true power of that shift and how radically it's changing young people and how they interact with each other and the world is yet to be seen and you know i just uh i have a son who's about to turn 18 and he he doesn't ever use a phone he has a phone but he only texts he will never call anyone and he's typical i mean him and his friends the only way they're ever going to call is if it's like lap worst case scenario essentially and he'll go right from like our whole kind of methodology of doing a phone call uh, hey, how are you? Oh, yeah, okay. Well, anyway, you want to go to the... Is out the window. Usually when he picks up the phone, if he actually answers the phone, he goes straight from the language of a text into the call. So whatever was the last text, there's no hello. There's no, like, courtesy, how are you doing or anything. It's just like, are you coming to the party was the text, and he just picks up the phone and goes, yeah, dude, I'm going. There's no goodbye. There's no... I mean, really, but it's not rude. In their world, it's just like... That's how it is. And I think it's really important to note that like, we will look at it as old people and say, like, that's, that's rude. That's not the way it's done. But it is the way it's done. We're just old. <laughs> that's really like, 
how so many things are. I mean, even him at his age, I still remember the first time I told him about CDs and like a CD store because he had seen a CD, but he was like, what is this stupid thing in the car? And I, I was like, well, there used to be, you know, this, not even talking about records, I'm talking about CDs. <laughs> so he's like, I literally had to tell him, well, there used to be all these stores where they had stacks of these and you went and bought them. And his reaction was literally like, huh, that's so stupid. <laughs> and it, it just, like, on a really deep level, he's just like, well, that's dumb. Like, we, obviously, like, the future is far superior to that stupid past. <laughs> and there's so many things like that that I just think that, the, you know, the point being fundamentally is the generation gap from, you know, our industry's perspective to me is radically bigger than people think it is. And they really, you can't overestimate how sophisticated and how smart these young people are. Their view of the world and their understanding of so many layers of reality, so many layers of the market, of where their place in the world is, what is possible in the world, what they value is, in, it is intrinsically, like fundamentally different than one generation prior. And who knows, you know, maybe this, that goes into a much deeper conversation about, you know, people becoming part robot and these kinds of futurist ideas where, you know, if you really look at things, we're on a quick track to that happening. And that goes into kind of a sci-fi world, but in our world right now, as brands or as designers, I think that people tend to talk about things and talk about design even, or brands or marketing in a way that feels like they're talking to themselves or their peers. And that's just human nature. That's like all of us looking at, you know, the people around us, what do you think? Are they school, this is it, what do you look, this is our experience, we're all kind of on this one wave, we're riding the same wave. And I'm kind of saying that the people behind us are on a completely different wave. And so unless you're thinking in a way that is sort of a new modality, or at least attempting, you're not gonna be able to predict the future or get it right. Um, all the time, but if you're trying, or you're at least trying to put your your thought processes into that space, you're going to be able to like have some things work, and you're going to be able to connect with people in uh, some ways, but not all. I think um, <coughs> kind of going back to that idea of the self, and one of the things that I think to me is really interesting on that topic is, I think the internet, and there's been a lot written about this, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on it, but I think the internet did inherently kind of drive people into a lonelier place for most people. That they spend more time just kind of going down the rabbit hole, spend more time alone, less time with other people. It was more about just their interests, their hobbies, things that fascinated them, things that you know they read about or keeping up with the world, but they didn't, weren't connecting with other humans or, taking what they learned on the internet and transferring it manifestly into the physical world that often. Um, and that's where social media to me has really changed things. And I put a lot of thought into social media because I think fundamentally it has many, many problems, many, many negative things about it. You can go on and on, but it is very different from the internet in that it is about communication, connection with other people. It is about conversation on some level, be it negative, positive, all the way up until, you know, starting kind of with Facebook and then leading to what, something like Tinder, which is essentially extremely, you know, quick connection and then leading directly into actual connection in the physical world, where Facebook was more about keeping in touch, telling everyone what you're up to, and it's led all the way to something like Tinder where it's just like, you're cute, I'll meet you at the bar. <laughs> and that's, you know, really actually a huge, uh, like a huge shift in a quick amount of time. And I think most of the development and most of the technology that was being developed for a long time was essentially being developed for the internet and it's, it's kind of mode. And then now you see this kind of second wave of these apps and all the, you know, Instagram, Tinder, all these things like that that are becoming extremely important players in the world and affecting people's lives are really more about culture and they're more about people connecting with each other than they are about what the internet was originally. And that's sort of a fascinating shift, I think, and it goes to kind of 
you know, her introduction at the beginning of the day is that really what I think about and what I'm focused on is culture. Um, I'm, uh, you know, very passionate about culture in general. And in our industry, the reason I started a company wasn't because I thought that the North Face or one of the large, you know, foundational brands was blowing it with their backpacks. Um, I think they, the most of those products are fantastic and will do, you know, there's plenty of amazing product. But what I saw was a huge uh, hole in the culture that meant anything to me as a consumer um, and inspired me or had sort of my peers or anyone younger than me um, taking any interest. So that kind of leads me to, uh, I kind of wanted to jump off from there to talking about how does that relate to uh, Portland? Why are we in Portland? Why is this conference in Portland? Um, why did I kind of find my home in Portland? Um, to me, it's kind of interesting as, a, as sort of a beta or a, a kind of analog for what's happening in our broader culture. Um, and here's another quote that I found really inspiring, which uh, kind of relates to that. <clears throat> Maya Angelou said, I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you do or did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And I've always, uh, that's always resonated with me. And I think as you know, designers and kind of in this community, it's really take note to me that in our industry, this, this culture we're in is about things that people love. It is not about motherboards or widgets or some you know, product that doesn't really have any connection to the human spirit. It is driven by and exists entirely because this is what people love to do when they're not working their ass off. And that's really, to me, kind of got lost in the overall conversation. It's, it's you know, for me, I, if I look back at my kind of key experiences in the outside world that meant a lot to me as a person that I'll remember on my deathbed, they don't involve a lot of gear. And they don't involve really specific gear. I'm not going to remember what my backpack was in you know 50 years, but I will remember swimming in a lake with my daughter for the first time. And I think everybody can say something similar in the end. You know, in the in the short term, those things are very important. Design, the gear, everything is 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 very important to people, and there's if there's totally a place for it. But in the long run. It's, you know, it is a sort of a means to an end, at least to me. <clears throat> so I think, you know, going kind of to Portland, how does that all tie in? To me, cities in our, at least in our country, and, you know, in kind of human history, largely were founded on either geography, they're, in, they're a port, they're uh, where the timber is, they're where, you know, the rivers connect. There's, uh, there's, you know, sort of, those are like the foundational roots of most cities, major cities, um, and industry. You know, I mean, uh, the ports being the most common originally, and then you know, Chicago, Pittsburgh, places where steel was being made, where trains converged, where you know, shipping centers. Those are sort of the roots, and we're now entering this this kind of unprecedented phase where that's no longer very relevant for our culture. And cities like Portland being one of kind of the leaders are sort of the second wave of, of city where we, yes, we were a timber town. We had, you know, sort of a port that was crucial at certain points in the history, but that had sort of died. And without Nike, you know, people can um, kind of bash Nike if they want, but Portland really wouldn't exist as a town as it is right now without Nike in my mind. I mean, the amount of people that have come through Nike that even if they leave and start other things or, you know, the Wyden Kennedy, so many of the other brands, all the footwear, all these things are, are uh, here largely because Nike was here. And that kind of got us through to a certain point. And up until that point, this city all of a sudden became known for culture. And when people visit Portland, they're coming largely for an experience. They're not coming to see the Empire State Building or the Golden Gate Bridge or the Hollywood Walk of Fame or any of these kind of cultural landmarks that, that would be on your top 10 list in like the really, the, at least New York and LA 
the two you know, most kind of major cities in America, Portland has become sort of this much smaller place, but everybody wants to come to go out to eat and to the bars and to check out Stumptown Coffee and Powell's Books. And those are sort of voodoo donuts. Those have become the top 10 list of everyone that comes to Portland, all these shows. And it's uh, really worth noting how I think that's really unusual and unprecedented. And it speaks to how young people are viewing what they value and why they would go somewhere to visit something. Uh, another city is changing and shifting. And it is very cultural rooted. And Portland is really a new archetype for that. And a lot of those people come here and they feel a sense of place and belonging and home and connection to the community in some metaphysical way that they don't where they live. And that's why this is becoming, uh, the last couple of years, this is the number one place to move to in America. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's largely really young people. And a lot of them don't have jobs. There's not a lot of jobs here. So it's very competitive. And you have a, a lot of people coming here for the first time basically saying, why well, don't give a shit if I have a job? I'm going to make it work. And I may have a law degree, but I'm going to work at a bar because I want to be here and I'm going to meet other people that I like here and have a lifestyle or, you know, kind of a cultural connectivity that I value more than being somewhere else and having, you know, X job or this career path or whatever it is. And I don't think that, from what I know, that really has, hasn't ever happened. I mean, that only the closest thing to that is sort of the, the really broad idea of like, if you can make it in New York, you can make it anywhere, or going to Hollywood to be a movie star. Um, but that was a much more specific, much less likely, much more kind of amorphous idea. Um, I think social media has really dramatically changed the way people are viewing where they live and what their life is like. Instagram alone, I would say, you know, a lot of people first get exposed to Portland at this point through Instagram. Their friend goes there, shoots a bunch of cool photos of the weekend they had and all the amazing food they ate and the, the bars they went to and blah, blah, blah. And that is inspiring. And it, it's like something where they say that I want that experience. I envy that. I want to be there. It's not just a passive experience. It feels like a cultural experience that means something. And a lot of people come out, I mean, I have neighbors that literally came out for the weekend and never left. Uh, that's not going to happen for everybody, and it's not like Portland is necessarily better than everywhere else, but it is a fascinating kind of new way of thinking about where we live and why. And it does connect with design and the culture, the lifestyle. This, this, this place has a reputation for being connected to the outside people bicycling, people being able to access the natural world very easily and without too much fuss. And that's definitely part of the draw. And it's part of the value system that people are judging as valuable and wanting to be a part of. I think the, um, you know, I think the internet, like, I guess the last thing I want to touch on that is really, I think the idea of looking at something on your phone and saying, I want to do that, and then actually doing it is actually pretty new. You know, escapism and looking at awesome stuff on the internet has obviously been around for a long time, but I think the number of young people, that's, that's one of those generation shifts that I really want to touch on, is the older people just go, that's amazing, Machu Picchu, that is an incredible photo, and somebody young will just be like, I'm going there next month, <laughs> and like make the plan, and they actually do, you know, I mean, I've seen it even with, you know, the brand that I started. You, I have people just write, like, I, you know, just as a polar, I bagged my job, and I bought, you know, a truck, and now I live in a truck, and I'm driving <laughs> to California, and blah, blah, blah. But that's actually, like, there's been a lot of people that say things like that, and I'm not trying to, like, tell people how to live their lives by any means. But at the same time, it's really interesting just on a philosophical level that anyone will look at something on their phone that seems, you know, not very long ago, that A, they would never have seen, B, they wouldn't have envied, they wouldn't even have had a real perception of how it connected to their life or, or why. And now it can become this thing uh, uh, that changes their life completely, changes their, like, the main decisions in their lives, where they're going to live, who they're going to live, with, how they're going to live. But, you know, all that time, I think, I guess... The reality is, is that's happening because we all spend our time in front of monitors. We spend, and I do, I spend most of my time in front of a computer or on my phone. 
And that's, I'm building a business, I'm working my ass off, and I've you know, chosen that path, I'm not complaining, but it is really interesting to see how many of us, that's reality in our culture. And so much of the imagery that we look at online and things that are, we're now connecting with, and why outdoor has all this momentum is fundamentally escapism. It's, uh, you know, I've heard it called earth porn, <laughs> which I thought was really funny because it's sort of like magical tropical sunset on your computer screen, you know, just sort of taunting you all the time is, uh, is, is an interesting idea. And it, it really does motivate people and does, causes uh, both grief and it causes people to go to the, you know, go on a trip sometimes. So it's, it's a really interesting idea. But the, the main result of that is the pendulum can only swing so far that way. Humans were not designed or evolved or however you want to look at it to sit in a cubicle and look at a monitor. We know that much. We don't know exactly you know, the, every detail of human history, but the reality is people have been using computers and spending most of their time interacting with them for a very, very short period of time. And the effects of that are pretty unknown. It definitely hasn't made a whole lot of people extremely happy. I know that, you know, I mean, even if you have a, even if there's things about it that you like or appreciate, most people given the option would be like, yeah, I don't want to do that anymore. I want to do something else. And that's, uh, that's really worth noting, you know, because as, as technology marches on, more and more of us are just doing more and more of that. That allows an opportunity for us as an industry to connect with people and inspire them to swing the other way and look to the outdoors as a, as an extremely steady, sort of unmoving, uh, uniformly sort of deep human uh, place of connection. And, you know, I guess when people go outside, like when I go to the beach with my kid, she's just gonna dig a hole. She just dig a hole <laughs> all day. And she'll sit in the hole, fill up with water, and go splash, and she'll be filthy, and she's super happy. That's it. She got her day, and that's what she wants to do. I mean, she's just as happy as anyone else that's ever been outside. I would argue, you know, when we watch the sunset together at the beach, it's no different than when, you know, cave people watch the sunset at the beach. Fundamentally. You know, I really believe that. The, the, whoever the first humans are watch the sunset, they may just go, oh, like, whatever it was. <laughs> There's some deep recognition that is important, it's beautiful, and it has some, you know, inspirational aspect that we all seek. And whether we admit it or not, we're all kind of looking for that. Whether we can articulate it, whether we even know it, everybody is looking for that connection because it goes so deep in, like, the primitive aspect of our beings. <coughs> you know, it's ultimately the the outdoors is just unmoved. It's, fun. I mean, overall, it's an unmoving kind of, it's there when you want to join it. When you want to go out and connect with it, it will be there for you on some level, which is an interesting concept. Okay, so I kind of want to bring that all around to a uh, more about kind of our industry and where I see things going and talking about some of the ideas that I guess were foundational to Polar. Um, this is a quote by David Foster Wallace, uh, one of my favorite writers. He said, there are these two young fish swimming along and they happen to meet an older fish swimming the other way. He nodded at him and said, morning boys, how's the water? And the two young fish swim on for a bit and eventually one of them looks over at the other and goes, what the hell is water? And it's a little bit weird, but if you think about it, I think it's super, super interesting that you can be surrounded by something and not even realize it or understand that it's a thing that has a definition or that it's something that could be even sort of talked about in a new way. And the point I kind of wanted to make with that story is the meaning of anything in our culture, the meaning of words is inherently transient. Words change their meaning over however, you know, some words change their meaning over five years, some years, some words take 5,000 years, but they definitely don't remain static. And what, in our industry, the word outdoor, it had a pretty specific meaning to me as an outsider. I think this industry was founded by 
kind of a particular group of people that uh, I have, you know, nothing against. They're great. They're, it's the primary thing it seems was mountaineering, which is awesome, and I'm not anti that by any means. Um, I'm very inspired by it personally. But what I found is that the conversation around the word and around the culture was very specific and it had been dictated sort of by this establishment of definition so long ago. And so coming in and saying, you know, to me, outdoor means not indoor, <laughs> basically. That's how I look at it, honestly. And, you know, if I walk down the street, I'm outdoors. And I, that may be the most time I spend outdoors that day, but it's definitely not being indoors and it has a completely different feeling. And it's definitely not anything to do with mountaineering or some of like the early kind of foundational sports or, you know, and sort of activities that the industry was based on. And I think that's really, really sort of a really base level of how I kind of came at things. And going into uh, the future, I think, Young people are going to redefine what outdoor means, what, you know, so many things mean, whether we like it or not. They're doing it. They may not run the businesses. They may not run the industry. But the language is changing. The way they talk about it changes. And it is what it is. And eventually, the industry and everybody else will adapt to what reality is, uh, the reality of the consumer that is their target, or they will die. Uh, because they're talking about something, not negatively. It's not a negative thing, but the conversation is, you know, it's the wrong conversation. It's like going to an NBA game and talking about archery. They're both sports. They're both competitive, but obviously you're not going to get anywhere. It just isn't going to work. And I think that is sort of where there's a lot of dissonance right now um, with a lot of brands. I think... Uh, You know, we, like I said, we don't really, I guess Polar isn't really philosophically, it wasn't positioned against anything. It's not positioned as a response in some tit for tat kind of idea. It was more positioned in a way that was, why can't we, why there can be room in the world for many things. There's room in the world for many businesses to succeed on some level and communicate in different ways. There is no one golden path that will lead to success for any brand in here. You know, what led to success for the North Face is, is not necessarily what will lead to success for Polar because this, the time it started, all the people, the, the, the factors of, of change and disruption and reality of how many different uh, things are at play to have anything be successful is so complex that it can't be repeated. It can't be mimicked successfully. Nothing like that will actually work. And yet there's more opportunity than ever for each individual idea to find its own path to being successful, at least on some level, depending on what your definition of that is. And you know, one of the dangers I think even in this room and being older or some of the people that are really experienced that run things is to romanticize the past and romanticize whether it's an old pack design or it's a, an old brand that has a huge, a tremendous heritage and <coughs> has a lot of uh, weight there and has a lot of meaning. There's a t there's a tendency for all of us to romanticize things, and you know myself included. Whether it's music um, or a brand or anything that you can think of. Um, but I always am reminded by I, one of my favorite quotes in the movie Fight Club. If you've ever seen that, is uh, that I found really inspirational is about how when old people talk about the past and how much better it is, what they're really communicating is their own obsolescence. That's what they're actually talking about. And there's nothing wrong with that, but I think people need to be aware that any conversation that goes down that road is essentially you just saying, I'm old and I like old stuff. <laughs> and I, everybody, I love a lot of old stuff. But if you're trying to do something new or survive in a new kind of a new paradigm, that's not going to go anywhere. So, to me, I, I think about music a lot um, as a as an analog for what I'm doing and, and for what I think a lot of us try and do. And 
too often design or even whole brands become essentially what I would think of as a cover band. You're basically looking at something that was wildly successful, whether it was ACDC or a particular jacket, you know, the Denali jacket uh, that sold a bajillion units, and then say, how can we do that? And that's essentially, that will only take you so far, no matter what you're doing, you're a cover band. You're covering a hit. Um, and the people that are gonna really change things that are gonna really have their own success on their own terms are gonna be new bands that have their own voice that don't sound like anything else or it's an amalgamation of so many things that it's an entirely new experience for the people and they connect with people emotionally and not just on uh, sort of like, a, oh, well, that's familiar, it feels good, it feels like, you know, I think that's super important for people to, to, to think about, at least for me, that's been something I think about daily is when people, you know, when ACDC came out, nobody was like, well, I don't know, like, you could sound more like Led Zeppelin. You know, they were really, they did really well. You know, maybe some jackass guy in the studio did, but ultimately people were just like, this rules, ACDC is sick, we want more. And that's like, you know, that's amazing, because they, that's just an example to me of something that, you know, nobody will go to them and say, hey, you know, you, you really should do a song like, you know, the, like, you know, Bob Marley, is, he sold so many albums and so many songs, that would be a cool look, and they're just going to be like, it doesn't make any sense, but in our world, it happens all the time, where people go, oh, well, you know, yeah, so-and-so did this, I mean, we should just, we should do that, and it's sort of casual, and it's not necessarily just like, rip off or has some pejorative thing it's just how people work and i'm guilty of it myself but it's definitely a dark alley you go down that will in a broad way in a long way will never really lead to anything <coughs> and um i guess bringing that back to sort of the the younger generation to me is looking for things that resonate with them that connect with the life that they're already leading. They're not looking to be told, like, this is what's cool. They're not looking to have anyone say, like, oh, if you skateboard, you also should ride a bike, and you should go rock climbing, or these are cool things that you don't know about. They already know it. They're already doing it. They're ahead of all of us. And so for, you know, for me, what I've tried to do is just be more of a reflection of what I think they're already doing as a brand and say, we did a collaboration with, with Specialized. We made a bike because a bike is a relevant thing to everyone that I know and everyone that I think I know. And I don't know for sure, you know, I can't say I, I don't have, I don't have focus groups, I don't have hard data, I don't have, you know, I don't research trends heavily or have these kinds of like uh, kind of typical, uh, I guess, big business methodologies, but it's, it's more just about looking and saying, I don't know, what are kids into? What do they have, you know, what are they doing? How are they living their lives just in general, day to day? And how does that connect to what we do? I think people are really, really looking for things that are presented to them in a way that respects their intelligence and says, we're not going to tell you about what we do. We're not going to be descriptive. We're going to, as Polar, what I want to do is inspire. And I want to have people connect with the brand emotionally and have people, you know, the coolest thing for me is to have someone say, I saw this story that you guys did online and I actually went and hiked to that waterfall and it was awesome. And if, you know, I don't really care initially if they buy our backpack or whatever it is because to me ultimately that's someone that will always have a positive feeling and emotion and a connection to what we're doing and eventually maybe they become a customer maybe they become you know a customer for life and you know, maybe not but even if they don't other people will and i think it's a uh, you know if you think about it like dinner if i if i came to you and said i made you this steak dinner I put the perfect amount of salt. I cooked it perfectly. It's the best steak money you can buy. Everything about it is the best. It is the best steak that you'll ever eat. 
and then put it down, then it, is it even humanly like possible for you to feel that way about the stick? <laughs> if there were me and someone said that to me, and I took a bite and I was like, this is the best steak. I'd be like, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> Just because I would be mad that the person was so arrogant. And yet, if you look at like, if we talk about a jacket, if so much of the conversation as a consumer in this, in this space, I go in and somebody's gonna go, this is the best jacket. This is the most technical jacket. This is the best fitting jacket. This is the most waterproof jacket. This is this, this is this, this is this, and here's why. And it's very persuasive, and maybe it is, but it's boring <laughs> to me. It may not be to everybody, but to me, I look at it and go, if I'm a college kid, and I'm at a bar, <clears throat> and I got my new, my new jacket, soaked, just dropped some money, big deal for me, I'm feeling good, <laughs> see that special person with a twinkle in the eye, I'm trying it out, and then, I, they, oh, they actually come up and say, that jacket looks really good on you. They'd be like, yeah, it's super duper waterproof. <laughs> it's like, basically just, <laughs> I don't know if you, if you were in that situation for me, the person's going to be like, cool, <laughs> sorry, bro. <laughs> They come up and say, I, that jacket looks really good on you, and you're a college kid, and you're like, oh, yeah, I, I actually bought this jacket because I was inspired by this story about this waterfall where you can go camp, and we're going on the weekend, you want to maybe go with me, and some friends are going, and, you know, that's like your, uh, that's your typical college kid, I think, uh, personally. I don't think that they're necessarily that, the number one reason that a college kid is buying a jacket is to look cute. Male or female, that's my proposition, <laughs> straight up. <laughs> they may also want it to be waterproof, but the reality is they want other people to be like, damn, you look good. <laughs> and that's like, that's human nature. And going back to like this, the previous talk about sneakers and bags and everything, so much of that conversation to me, why are people crazy about sneakers? It's because they want to look awesome. <laughs> and sneakers make them feel good about themselves and feel like they look awesome, and that gives them confidence to go out in the world and be better versions of themselves. And that's like the true power of a sneaker, which is really weird, but I think it's true. I don't think it's so much about, you know, I've never bought sneakers personally. I don't go buy Air Maxes because I'm like, oh, these have the perfect footbed. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait to walk on these. <laughs> like, and that's not just being dumb. I mean, I, of course, comfort and construction and technology and everything plays a role, and they all have to be there. But I look at it more like I come from a uh, filmmaking background, and I, I've edited a lot of film. And editing film, editing digital video, is super interesting because to me, it's almost like the darkest art. It's the most transparent art there is. When it's done right, no one notices it at all. When it's done poorly, it is unwatchable, horrific <laughs> filth. <laughs> and that's just true. If you watch a movie and the editing is garbage, it's unwatchable. And if you watch a movie where it's perfect, you don't even see it at all. And that's something that all good design should strive to be, you know, ultimately, is it's more about the person and the people using it and the transparency that they feel the emotion of why they connect with it, where it's going to take them, how it's going to improve their lives, than it is about any tech story or anything that they can possibly talk about. It's deeper than that. And I think, you know, there's an old adage that I, I, I think of that ties into that. It's really all design, sorry, everything in the world was designed except what is part of the natural world. Everything that's not nature was designed by a human at some point. And I think we really forget that. I mean, going way back, every single physical thing that we have here on Earth was designed by somebody unless it was already part of the natural world. And where that came from, that's a separate topic that people can debate outside here. <laughs> but, you know, that's really inspirational and it's really interesting to me that a 
it, it, I think people get focused on a backpack or how something's stitched or this new fabric when to me, my mind goes to the bigger kind of broader picture and there's a place for both, you know, and there's a place for both conversations, I think. I think that's sort of a, you know, kind of what I wanted to wrap up with is just going back to that idea that Social media is really interesting.